This morning, if you have your word, we invite you to open up to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6. We'll be reading to you verses 25 through 34 from an NIV translation of God's holy word. Let us hear the word of God. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to this life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you not, that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning for our sermonic uh, exploration, I want to read to you verse 33 coming to us from a new revised standard version of the Bible. And these words are a little bit different from the NIV, but I think they will serve as, as important information, but also as spiritual motivation for our lives. For the Bible says in verse 33, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. And this day, as we preach from uh, the last of three-part sermons on decisions that will change your life, I want to lift up this text and for a brief moment preach on our subject, strengthening by striving, strengthening by striving. My friends, from hospitals to universities, from credit unions to insurance companies, from catering services to barber shops, from funeral homes to civic organizations, many, if not most, of the community organizations that we know of have a history of some form and a relationship of some kind that is tied to the church. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen right there. Amen. Be it a place that they first met or be it an address where they receive their articles of incorporation, churches have been a physical location and churches have been a moral house for organizations and institutions that have made a com contribution to our community and made our community what it was and made our community what it is today. For out of the church, my friends, have come hospitals, and out of the church have come nursing homes, and out of the church have come protests, and out of the church have come conversations and legislation. From the basement of a church came Morehouse College. From the sanctuary of a church came Shaw University. From the Missionary Society came Howard University and Dillard University. And from Evangelist came Knoxville College and Stillman College and Barbara Scotia College and Johnson C. Smith University. 
From the church, my friends, there was a daughter of a preacher named Aretha Franklin that became the queen of soul. From the church, from, from the gospel caravan, from Sissy Houston came a daughter named Whitney Houston. From the church, a son of a Baptist deacon from Macon, Georgia came Otis Redding. From the church, we have from Mississippi, the staple singers. All the touch of my love, emotions came out of the church. From the church, my friends, we understand Stephanie Mills sang at the Cornerstone Baptist Church in Brooklyn, New York. From the church, we have Faith Evans from none other than Emmanuel Baptist Church. Yes, the notorious big wife came out of the church. From the church, as he went through Ivy League training, John Legend was the music director, y'all, at the Scranton AME Church. From the church, the queen of disco, Donna Summer, sang at the Grant AME Church in Boston, Massachusetts. From the church, Curtis Mayfield found himself writing and singing for Motown. From the church, my friends, God has blessed us with men and women, with institutions and with organizations that have made an impact upon our lives. Y'all, there is an interesting intersection between the church and society, and there is a phenomenal relationship, fascinating, shall we say, between the black church and civil rights. And it should not come to you as no surprise that on this Martin Luther King weekend that, that we talk about strength to love that is rooted in the church. A strength to love, as I echo Dr. King in his writings from 1963, this 59-year-old writing, y'all, is here to teach us a very important lesson about the church. In this writing, strength to love, Dr. King says that dictators have long used soft-mindedness among people to gain power. Oh, what a warning to us this day to, to be aware of dictators who are manipulating soft-minded people to gain power. He, he says that, that soft-mindedness is responsible for racism. Dr. King said some 58, 59 years ago that one of the major contentions of life, y'all, is that God intended for humans to be tough-minded but also soft-hearted. For he says that one day we will learn that the heart can never be totally right when the head is totally wrong. We have to stand on the word of God, but stand with the men and women of God who helped us un 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 uncover some of the ills of society, but most importantly, to cover ourselves in the word and the peace of Jesus Christ. Dr. King believed, y'all, that, that people should practice love and compassion. For what did he say? Jesus had the wisdom of the serpent, but the humility of the dove. And it's in important for us to see on this day as we go forward in the love of Almighty God that we will also have a strength to love in spite of the hate, a strength to love in spite of condemnation that others will put upon the church, strength to love in spite of the troubles and strength to love even as we struggle, as we go forward uh, doing the will of Almighty God. Hear what I'm saying because on this day I want to somebody to recognize that Jesus is speaking to you as he spoke to those individuals some 2,000 years ago about getting their priorities in order and making solid decisions. Here, what I'm saying on this MLK weekend that God is calling the church of Jesus Christ to keep the first thing the first thing and the main thing the main thing. And that is exactly what we want to lift up in this text as we speak and preach on on strengthening by striving, strengthening by striving. What you're saying, Reverend, I'm saying that oftentimes we forget that our strength comes as we move forward. Oftentimes we forget that our, that our power come as we press our way toward the mark of the high calling. You see, when God first gave this word to Jesus, it was a clear sign, I believe, that he's speaking to this audience at the Sermon on the Mount and he's trying to help them recognize that if they keep their focus and their trust and their eyes on the Messiah, if they keep their hope in the one who they've been praying 
sin for then those things that come upon them and those things that cover them, those things that cause them worry will be taken care of. For the Bible tells us that where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, your treasure is not just your dollars and your stocks, your bonds, your gold, your jewelry, your Rolex, or your red bottom shoes. Your treasure is where your heart is and your treasure is those possessions to which orientate your being. Come here, Reverend Mack, for that's exactly it. Our treasures are not necessarily material possessions, but instead it's the orientation of the thing that we let our lives evolve around. What, what is your treasure? Where is your heart? Where is your mind? What gets you up early in the morning and keeps you up late at night? Where, what causes you to go out of your way to make a way for that thing or that person? That's what your treasure is. And as we spotlight the main point of the text today, Jesus is trying to give us some teaching and some understanding again about God worrying about our treasures but keeping our hard focus on almighty God. Don't know who I'm talking to this Sabbath day but I want you to recognize that do not get distracted by the things of the world and get your eyes off of God. Do not get so consumed about what other folk are saying or what they are doing and keep your, excuse me, and get distracted from doing the will of God. Yes, I know it's tempting to watch the news. Yes, I know it's inviting to hear the last tidbit and the last sound, but yes, I know how addictive it is to get on TikTok and forget you've got something in the oven cooking and you burn everything. Yes, I know uh, how inviting it is to get on the phone and start talking about things that are not really in the Bible, but you cannot get distracted, particular in times like this. For you've got to strive, and in your striving, I believe that's where you get your success from. I got to share a quote with you from Dr. George Washington Carver. He talks about striving, but also of the different seasons that we go through in life. Life. Dr. Carver says, uh, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the age, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant with the weak and the strong. Why? Because if you live long enough, you're going to experience all three of these phases. Come here, let me see if I can help you understand this message that Jesus has given us today. For it's a message conveying that no one can have two masters, for you will be loyal to one or you will be disloyal to the other. What Jesus was saying, y'all, is that you can't serve both God and money. Here's your tweet for the week. When God is the master of your life, then we can see and follow the command not to worry. Again, when God is the master of your life, you can, be, you can fall into that command of not to worry. What does it say in verse Verse 25, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about life, what you will eat or drink or about what your body will put on is not life more important than food and the body more important than your clothes. Do I, can, do I need to just help someone recognize that the clothes you bought in 1980, even though they still have the price tag on, if you can't fit them, then... Okay, can I help somebody just release some things in your life right now? The, 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 the things that you thought you were going to do in your 40s that now you are in your 50s and 60s. It's best for you to wrap those things up and give them. You, can I help somebody right now to release and, and relieve yourself of some anxieties of how other folk will put things upon you and you thought you should respond to them? The message is when you 
you are connected with Christ, you can let go of a lot of other stuff because that is other stuff is not really about almighty God. The Bible tells us is that I cannot worry, not because it was in verse 24, 25, but was really hooked up in verse 24. The guarantee is that if I don't serve to masters, then my God will be with me. The guarantee in 25, if God takes care of the birds in the air, and if God takes care of the lilies of the field, and if God takes care of the grass that withers and grows, then I show no know that God will take care of me. And I think I'm talking to somebody this Sabbath day who knows that God will take care of you. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied. Come on, y'all. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care. Has God taken care of you before? Has God answered a prayer for you in your life? Has God released some hell out of your life? Has God brought you through some trouble in your life? Has God picked you up when others folk put you down? Has God put your life back together when the devil tried to destroy it? Has God been there in the midst of your trials and tribulations? Be not dismayed, for God will take care of you. The Bible, the Bible is replete with story on top of story of how God comes through in the nick of time. And I don't know if you are that kind of witness this morning, but can you just type right there in the nick of time, okay? If you can't say in the nick of time, can you say on time? Because you see, God is that kind of God that will come through on time. The Bible says, do not worry. Recognize that the do not worry is, is given, Minister Donna, in the present active imperative, which is implying that the folk were already worrying about stuff they had no business worrying about. Let me back it up and say that again. The, the Bible says, do not worry. And what it says, Dr. Monroe, is that the people were actively worrying, even in the midst of the Messiah, in the midst of Jesus, who was able to feed 5,000 with, with, with a five buttermilk biscuits and two croakers. Jesus was able to do tremendous work, but they were worried. How can you worry? You see, the word worry itself means to be anxious about a problem or danger. The word worry means you are anxious, you are excited, you are anticipating something. It is reference to dividing the distracting the mind. You, you will notice that Jesus was commanding y'all, his hearers, to stop worrying about things of life, about what to eat and what to wear, what to put on your body. You see, worry is that sin uh, of distrust in God because we do not trust God for everything. And I don't know if you look like the little boy on the screen, but I want you to recognize that sometimes when you let worry of other folk come into your space, you can't help but to put your hands on your cheeks like this and your lips poked out and say, oh, woe is me. You see, when you recognize what God does in one's life, you have to understand is that God is here because worry what? It is, it, it, it is energy that you give on a bill. It is interest that you pay on a charge that may not even happen. And Jesus is saying, I want those who are called by my name, those who follow me, I want you to understand that you shall not worry because you're hooked up with me. If I can take care of the birds of the air, what does it say? That the Father will feed the birds, the Father will feed, and they take no thought about where they're going to get their next bill. But don't miss the footnote. Here it is. God will feed the birds, but God God ain't going to drop the worm in the nest. Okay, God will take care of the birds, but the birds got to use their instinct to get up early and go get the worm. You see, many of us right now, we are worried and praying that God will bless us and God will give us certain things, but you've got to get off your dusties and get up and go to work. For the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, if you don't work, 
Come on, type right there in the chat box. What does it say? If you don't work, you sure enough ain't going to eat. But God gives you the instinct, the instinct to think and the instinct to move and the instinct to create and the instinct to make a difference in somebody else's life. The text helps us realize that we have the human capacity to do great things. And please don't forget, here's another point of the footnote, y'all, is that birds, they don't overeat. You've never seen a fat bird? <laughs> birds get fat and they overeat when humans start feeding birds in the cage. And I think I'm talking to somebody right now because you've let some humans feed some things in your mind and so you've gotten fat on the things of the world and not the word of all. I'm preaching hard as I can. You ought to be responding right there. Somebody ought to thank God right there that Reverend has freed you up on this third Sunday in January, a new year, to stop letting other folk feed you and because, because you are being fed by them, you become obese and obese overweight with the worries of the world. You need to feed on the word of Almighty God. You see, the good news of the text, y'all, is that Jesus teaches that those who are paying attention to the body, you can't even give one minute, let alone an hour added to your body, which means you got to have your thinking and your focus directed toward Almighty God, worrying about what your body will wear, worrying about what you will have on, worrying about how you're going to look in the eyes of somebody else. I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody got your pajamas on right now, Watch and worshiping church right now in your pajamas. You ain't never thought about worshiping God without putting some Sunday clothes on, but thanks be to God, I ain't worried about what you look like, and you ain't worried about what you look like to me right now. You ought to give God a hallelujah right now. I no longer worry about what I'm going to wear to church. No longer worry about what my hair looks like. No longer worry about what my shoes look like. I just thank God I can praise God for whom all blessings flow. I can praise God from whom God gives me the life below. I just give God thanks and praise, and I ain't worried about a doggone thing. I give God praise for who God is in my life. Oh, the good news, the good news, my friends, is when you don't worry, you can be like Solomon. What does the Bible say? With all of his wisdom and all of his majesty, Solomon could not close the lilies of the fields like Almighty God. And I say this as a parenthetical footnote, recognize when Solomon was given the opportunity to get anything in the world that Solomon wanted, Solomon simply prayed, God, give me the wisdom to govern your people. Give me the wisdom to make good decisions. Give me the wisdom to honor and to serve you. Yo, the good news is that when we understand that we got to have faith, Faith, in the words of Dr. King, is taking the first step, not even being able to see the whole staircase. Recognize what the text is telling us is that, that, that we've got to have faith in God, that God will provide for all of our needs. And, and the good news, y'all, is that we move away from trusting self and trusting others to trusting Almighty God. Two concepts that I found, Brother David, that really helped me recognize I cannot trust people. When you do not have a relationship with God, we place our hope in things like food and clothes and cars and houses when you don't have a relationship with God you have no hope that God will pull you through that God will answer your prayer you got to have the faith in Almighty God that God will answer and that God will provide you see Dr. King helped us recognize and see this because he says number one Christians uh, the Christian life requires a tough mind and a tender heart tough mind and a tender heart. What does that mean, Reverend? That means that we have to think, but as we think, we will also think. Mm. Okay. A tough mind, Dr. Moreau, means that I got to remember where God has brought me from. And on my way to going forward, I got to thank God that I ain't where I used to be. Okay, all right, there's some holy folk watching right now who's got selective amnesia and you forgot where God has brought you from. So I just want all those who used to be hooked on crack, I want you to type right there, I remember. Okay, I want all of those who used to have no dime for shoe shine to write, write right there, I do remember. 
remember. Somebody right now who got a Pell Grant, I want you to type in the chat box, I remember. Somebody right now who used to get some government cheese and that free milk, that powder milk, this type, I remember. Okay, somebody right now who got some free lunch, hey, right there, I do remember. All right, here's the grace at the free lunch, y'all. The grace when the cafeteria lady says, where's your free token? And you didn't have one. And she said, come on through anyway, baby. I remember. Somebody right now who remember that somebody gave you a holy handshake at the end of service, that $5, you put four hours worth of gas and got a dollar snack at McDonald's. You got type right there. I do remember. The good news when you have a sense of a tough mind and a tender heart, you remember the grace of Almighty God. Let me go quickly because you see, number two, Dr. King helps us understand and strength to love. The Christian life depends on the fact that God is able. God is able. I know there's about four of y'all in the chat room right now I can say God is able. There's somebody in your house right now who needs to hear you get up from this service and say God is able. There's somebody that you work with, somebody on a Zoom call, you need to tell them this week that God is able. Because you see, if we ever forget that God is not able, we will be consumed by a, by a, by a mind that a dictator can consume, and by a mind that a dictator will make us do things that are not God-like. You see, y'all, the text is teaching us to make good decisions, and all our decisions are decisions that be made with God being the focus, and God being the center, and God being what is it about. You see, our decisions, even decisions to take the vaccine, decisions to wear the mask, the decisions to, to, to keep our social, our decisions, y'all, are directed by Almighty God. And I just pray that you will be open to the Spirit of God that will help you make solid decisions, decisions that will cause you to strive. What is striving? Striving is pushing forward and not giving up. What is striving? Striving is doing your very best because you have a goal in front of you. Come here, Christian McCaffrey, the running back of the Carolina Panthers. You help me understand what striving is. He says, it is a constant progression, and as long as you are constantly striving to be better, you're headed in the right direction. Recognize what striving is. Striving means that I'm going forward. I'm pressing toward the higher mark. I'm looking to where God will take me. The text, y'all, is saying that I know that you will have some problems, but, but Jesus is saying if you're seeking me, if you're striving toward me, the word, of Brother L, strive and seek are synonymously used to make sure that it means an active movement, a, a, a striving toward. I, I I'm strengthening my striving. I'm, I'm encouraging my striving. I don't give up, a Pastor Lance, and in my striving because my striving gives me strength and my striving helps me understand what I'm going through is still going to take me to my ultimate goal. You see, I like the way Cicely Tyson says it. She says, I want to believe that there is a mountain so high uh, that I will spend my entire life striving to reach to the top of it. The promise, the promise in verse 33, y'all, is what God rules in our lives is that we must be, be striving toward because if we're striving toward the things of Almighty God, not only do we not worry, but it says that our needs will be provided. When we're striving, looking up toward heaven, we cannot help but to look toward our creator, our creator that made us. I like what Psalms 121 says, Sister Margaret, it says, I will lift my eyes into the heavens when cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. I got to keep looking up, Brother Sean. I cannot look down, Brother Mike. I got to keep looking up toward the heavens, Dr. Carroll, in the sense of knowing that as I look up toward heaven, God has a way of opening up the windows of heaven and not just pouring me out a blessing, but take care of my little old soul. Okay, let's see if I can close this out, Brother George, this way, because the story is told of a pioneer aviator who found himself flying around the world, and in so doing, he found himself on a remote landing 
connecting to his next leg. And while there, y'all, in this remote place, what he did not know when he got the board, when he when he got off the plane, something else got on the plane. What got on the plane was a rodent. Okay, if you don't know what a rodent is, country folk we call it a rat. A rat got on the plane, and as a rat got on the plane, the pilot didn't know it, so he took off, and as he took off, he began to lose uh, speed, and as he lost speed, he lost pressure, and as he lost pressure, he lost al altitude, but as he was losing this, he kept on applying more gas and applying more energy, and the plane propellers, y'all, were doing the best they could, but what he was, he did not what he failed to realize is that this new passenger, this rat, y'all, was gnawing away at one of the power cords. And he, he was in a panic mode and didn't know really what to do. And so he called to the tower and he says, look, tower, I'm flying, but I'm losing speed and I'm losing altitude. What shall I do? And they says, well, what's the problem? And the pilot looked down and says, there's a rodent, there's a rat that's chewing on the power cord. And the tower Howard said, that's not a problem. He said, what you mean it's not a problem? I'm losing speed. I'm losing altitude. It's a problem for me. He says, no, you see a rodent, but I see a possibility. Can I help somebody? Because there are some rodents in your life that are causing you to worry. Some rodents in your life that are causing you to lose faith. Some rodents in your life that are gnawing away at your power source. And here's what the tower says. The tower that could see things that the power could not see. The pilot could not see. The tower told the pilot, listen, all you got to do is pull back on the throttle and take the plane a little higher. What you mean? If you pull back on the throttle and take the plane a little higher, the tower was telling the pilot that the rodent, the rat, the thing that was gnawing on this power source could not take higher altitudes. Can I talk to you this Sunday morning? Because God is asking you to pull back on your throttle and God is asking you to take your situation a little bit higher. God is saying, if you look to the heavens when it's come with your help, knowing your help comes from the Lord, all those things that you are worried about have a way of dying. All those things you are worried about have a way of losing their power and their strength. You see, uh, when you recognize that Jesus being the center of your joy, come here, Richard Smallwood, you will understand that God has a way of taking you higher to a level that you're focusing upon him. You see, the good news, my friends, is that this text is tailored to teach us that we are strengthened as we strive toward a relationship with Almighty God. This text is tailored to teach us that be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. This text is tailored to teach us is that as we focus on seeking and striving, Jesus says that these things will be taken care of. Matter of fact, he ends up and he says, tomorrow has enough trouble of his song, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. I want to give an invitation on this Sabbath day for you to make Jesus the center of your joy. This is the invitation for you to stop worrying and start believing. Yes, we've heard it said before, if you're going to pray, don't worry, and if you're going to worry, don't pray. That sounds good when you ain't got no problems, but I want to talk to somebody with a problem this Sunday morning, and I want to ask you, will you take your eyes off your problem and put them on the Savior? I'm going to ask you this Sunday morning, if you will take your, your focus off the things that you're worried about and put them on the, the one who created you. For God didn't create any of us to be weary warriors, but God really created us to be in relationship with him. How does that happen? The word says, if you confess at your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. What does that mean for me, Reverend, if I've already been saved, but I'm still worrying? It means you get back into the Word. You read, you saturate yourself in the truth. And you say, Father, not my will, but let thy will be done. We are closed tomorrow for Martin Luther King holiday, but it is a day of service. So I invite you to go out and be of service somewhere in our community. Thank you for your contributions that you continue to make to this church and our community. 
This is Pastor Ken, and I love you, praying for you, and wish God's blessing to be upon you this day and forever. Y'all have a wonderful Sabbath day.